I will introduce the chair of the first session, and the chair is Dr. Rohit Sarin, and he's the director of the National Institute of TB and Respiratory Diseases, and it, which is an autonomous institute functioning under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. He is also chair of WHO's Regional Green Light Committee for MDR-TB in Asia, Southeast Asia region. Dr. Sarin is one of the leading technical experts on TB in India today, and he has significantly contributed to effective TB prevention and control in the country. Dr. Sarin, welcome. Thank you, Martin, uh, for the kind words of introduction. Well, friends, a very good morning to all of you and to our colleagues and partners all over the world, depending upon what time of the day it is, good day. I would say it's a historic moment. It's a historic moment for all of us here in India, and it's a historic moment for India office, because today, we are celebrating the scientific day of the MSF in this country and we are doing it for the first time. And I'm sure whenever we look back on scientific days, today, 8th May 2015, will always be remembered. So I'd like to start by congratulating the MSF and the team under the leadership of Martin who has made this happen and I'm sure that this is an event which will continue over the years to come. Well friends, the morning session is a very interesting session because it is focusing on something which we are all concerned about and that is neglect. Neglect for diseases, neglect for cohorts, neglect for populations. And we have four presentations in this particular session. And each of these four is talking on some or the other aspect. Before I move on for the subsequent session, I will say that my first speaker is Shaneri Ann Lim. She's a pediatrician by qualification and she joined the MSF about three years back. Her major place of work or I would say research is primarily in Sierra Leone and Pakistan and uh, she has done a lot of missions on emergency exploratory basis also. She's from Manila St. Luke's College and I'm sure that we will all have a feast on what she has to talk of which is a neglected stigmatized disease cutaneous meniasis. This is on her experiences in Balochistan and Pakistan. So it's over to you Chen Thank for you the so next much. 10 minutes or 12 minutes okay. whatever you feel comfortable with. Thank you so much. Um, so good morning everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable speaker, panelists, and all the people streaming around the world. Today, I will be presenting a descriptive study on the neglect neglected stigmatizing disease, cutaneous leishmaniasis, in Pakistan. So if anybody knows, uh, Balochistan is the largest province of Pakistan with a volatile and unpredictable security context. There are a presence of a lot of vulnerable, marginalized and displaced populations with the centralized Ministry of Health. They have a high morbidity and mortality rate in the rural areas, especially among the women, infants, and young children. MSF OCA is working in the capital city of Baluchistan, which is Quetta. We are running two outpatient clinic for cutaneous leishmaniasis in Kushlak and one in Maryabat. These two clinics serve different target population. Kushlak serves the nomads and Afghan communities that has no access to health care, while Maryabat serves the minority population of the Hazaras community. 
which has the mobility limitations and facing persecution in the country because of their sectarian. Cutaneous leishmaniasis is a parasitic skin lesion which is transmitted by either a zoonotic cause, which is leishmaniasis major, or an anthropometric cause, which is leishmaniasis tropical. It has a vector which is the plevontomus sandflies and the animal reservoir are rodents. The lesions can be located both on the face and extremities and can cause extensive scarring and deformities which can lead to behavioral inferiorities and psychological insecurities. Cutaneous leishmaniasis is an easily treatable disease. It is self-limiting and only 2% of the infected develop lesions. The most commonly afflicted are the children because of their underdeveloped immunities. We don't treat all patients with lesions. We only treat lesions is located in the face and they are located over the joints and they are growing larger and if the duration is more than five to six months. This study analyzes the routinely collected data approved by the MSF Ethics Review Committee. The laboratory diagnosis is made by microscopic smear of skin lesions, aspiration, and treated with glucon time injection, which is an given both intralesionally or intramuscularly, depending on the location and quantity of the lesions. MSF OCA recently added a new CL clinic last June 2014 in Mariabat, the Menasir Bhutto Hospital. The data from 2013 to 2014 showed a markedly increase in the number of patients seen from 125 to 1,492 patients. The number of confirmed diagnoses is based on the laboratory is also increased from 36.9% to 42.6%. The percentage of the confirmed diagnosis is a bit low. That is because cutaneous leishmaniasis is mostly a clinical diagnosis. That is why also in 2014, we also started 671 patients on treatment. The cure rate is 97% with very de little defaulter rate of under 3% and with very low relapse rate of 4.2%. All relapse cases were restarted on treatment and discharge as cured. For relapse cases, we either extend the number of treatment or change the, the manner of injection. The type of lesions the clinic sees are usually ulcerative and nodular lesions with a lot of multiple popular lesions. A lot of the lesions have a duration of more than six months. The chances are this patient had already seek treatment in the facility and only was given partial treatment. Or so some, they don't know where to seek proper treatment before. Now, we are noticing that a lot of people come in with a lesion of less than three months. The reason for this is about the CL treatment that the center is now being the, now gi being giving and it is for free we would rather prefer that the patient come to us earlier so that the improvement will be better so what is emissions in all this the drug importation in Pakistan is a long administrative process with a six months lead time and a lot of further delays due to custom regulation importation requirements and frequent personal changes MSF is the only organization that is, being, that is giving free CL treatment in all over the country. And because of the population that we targeted, access also by the patient not limited to the target population is also limited due to the security constraint, which can include sectarian violence. What is the Ministry of Health's challenges? Currently, there is no cutaneous leishmaniasis surveillance reporting system in place. The World Health Organization disease early warning system was stopped due to funding constraint. There is low prioritization for the disease because of the low mortality rate. The low available in the market is expensive. In purchase in the black market, their quality assurance is also questionable. There are still a lot of places in the country with low awareness of the disease. So what is MSF doing right now? Currently, we're still continuing to analyze the program data and sharing our achievement with the Ministry of Health. The cutaneous leishmaniasis clinic is still integrated in the outpatient uh, department as what we have been doing in Benazir Bhutto Hospital. We are working closely with the Ministry of Health in Benazir Bhutto Hospital in Mariaba to showcase CL treatment in the region. We have a very good collaboration with, with the Ministry of Health 
the available treatment is still effective in the region. Hence, we will push to lobby to increase the priority and budget allocations for the disease, and we will improve public awareness of, the of cutaneous leishmaniasis in the community. In achieving this study, we would like to extend our acknowledgement to Benazir Bhutto Hospital, their medical superintendent and staff, the district health office assistant, the MSF staff in Quetta for tirelessly working in the clinic and cooperating closely with the government. I will finish with these pictures, which depict some of the happy faces of the people we were able to treat in the outpatient we are serving in Quetta. The picture on the right is of the tree lady, which all over her body and with a parasite test of more than 1,000. At first, she doesn't want to be seen because of the lesions on her body. A lot of people doesn't want to talk to her or even touch her because they are scared that they will get what she has. She was misdiagnosed to have leprosy even. But after treatment in our clinic, she has acquired her confidence back and is now working and smiling to everyone. We have brought back dignity to life on this patient. Thank you and mabuhay. Thank you, Chen. I would say that uh, uh, we, being the first session here, uh, are grateful to you for having kept to the time because that's uh, the most critical thing when you are online and having a direct cast. Uh, we uh, can take one or two clarifications at the outset. And then, of course, the discussions will happen at the end of the session. So if there are any points anyone wants to clarify at this point of time. Yes, we have some caller from outside. Uh, how is this difference different from PKDL and any reason why it affects children more? Yes, could I ask Jen to respond, please? Um, so PAKDL uh, is more of a post-cutaneous one, and it's uh, caused by leishmaniasis donovani. So for cutaneous leishmaniasis, uh, the reason why it affects only children is because of their uh, immunity status. Uh, their immune system is not yet well developed, so they are more prone to the disease. Okay, are there any other uh, clarification points, I would say, rather than discussion points? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Devan. You said that... So thank you for the question. Um, currently in the whole of Pakistan, there is no uh, CL treatment program by the government. Um, before, one NGO that has been giving free treatment, but they already uh, moved out of the country. So currently in the whole of Pakistan, it's only MSF that is giving uh, free treatment for cutaneous leishmaniasis. And um, for the second question, um, the cutaneous leishmaniasis treatment in Pakistan costs around um, 70, uh, 7 US dollars per injection. And uh, for a CL treatment, uh, for intralesional, you have to go to the clinic at least a minimum of eight. And for intramuscular, you go to the clinic at least a minimum of uh, 20 sessions. So that means um, for a very minimal wage uh, person, they wouldn't be able to um, afford such a lucrative uh, treatment for the disease. So that is why a lot of the people um, in the country is not being given treatment or is not being uh, treated for the disease. All right, we, that's the last one, and then we move on, right? All right, thanks, Chen, for a nice uh, talk. I was just wondering, what is an alternative to sodium antimony glucagon uh, which you would use? You know, there are many patients who would not like to take the injections, or they may not be in a position to take the injection. Is there an alternative with that you have used in uh, this, uh, these CL patients in Balochistan? Um, okay, thank you for that question. So, um, as of now, uh, there's still no other alternative uh, for uh, glucan team injection for treatment of cutaneous leishmaniasis. There has been proposal on using some other type of uh, treatment modalities. This is also something that we are looking in now, but as of the moment, glucan team injection is the only one that is available. Of course, as you said, uh, there are also a lot of um, example of for age for people with certain kinds of diseases. But since mostly we are treating a lot of uh, children, so they're more uh, susceptible to the treatment. 
Okay, thank you. So uh, if there are any further, uh, uh, I would say, discussion points, we'll take it at the end of the session. You'll have an opportunity once again. Uh, I'll uh, uh, now like to invite our second speaker, uh, Janet Osle. Uh, she is a field epidemiologist working for the MSF uh, in Myanmar, and she took her master's in public health at Emory University. Her main focus is on infectious disease epidemiology. And in fact, in a worked with MSF, she's also been with the CDC for quite some time, and she's worked in different countries, uh, primarily in the African subcontinent and uh, uh, in all parts of the world. And the area which she's going to talk on is something which has uh, an area of neglect. This is the immunocompromised individuals, adolescents having HIV positive. So there is a increased risk of treatment failure in HIV-infected adults in Kahot in southern Myanmar. So, uh, what to you? Uh, hello, everyone, or can you hear me? Ming uh, Laba, as we would say uh, in Myanmar. Uh, as we said, I want to talk to you about adolescence today. And I'm guessing that uh, of what country you're coming from or your generation, uh, you remember adolescence as a somewhat turbulent time. Adolescence can be a bit tough. It's a time when uh, every system of the body is going through dramatic developments, uh, especially adolescent brains. And for adolescents who are living with illness, particularly those who uh, are HIV infected, uh, it can be a really difficult time and those normal hormonal and physical changes that are part of the teenage years can seem really overwhelming uh, and can manifest in, in unpredictable ways uh, and be different. So adolescents are uh, kind of a special cohort generally, but I'd like to speak to you specifically today about a cohort of adolescents uh, in Myanmar, uh, where MSF uh, has been active in HIV and TB care, MSF Switzerland, I should say, uh, for over a decade. We're in the far south of the country, in that little tail of Myanmar, over by Thailand. Uh, it's uh, an, a region that uh, very coastal, interesting subpopulations that uh, depend on fishing industries. Uh, in Myanmar, HIV is not a generalized epidemic. Uh, it is more uh, fueled by high-risk populations, so men who have sex with men, uh, co uh, commercial sex workers, drug users, and in this region, actually, fishermen are also considered high-risk. Uh, the analysis I'll talk to you about today is part of an initiative that the uh, MSF Switzerland mission has started in the last few years, really integrating operational research and using and capitalizing on uh, the medical data that we have after almost a decade of, of working in the region. And that's our sort of clever name for our, for our operational research unit. I'd like to know more about that. We have a poster in the hall and online, a little shameless self-promotion. Uh, but what we were trying to do exactly was uh, take some of our medical data that we had and really look at the 10 to 19 year old cohort among those. We know that our doctors and our nurses and our counselors had certain suspicions about things that were happening, but we'd really never uh, before this point systematically uh, disaggregated that data to look at what was happening. And so what we did was a cross-sectional analysis of those adolescents. Uh, routinely collected data that was available uh, to us easily in the Fuchsia database. And for those of you who aren't, it's the follow-up and care for HIV and AIDS database developed by Epicent. Uh, we found that we had 248 patients uh, between the ages of 10 and 19 who'd ever been admitted in the 10 years of the clinic. Now, not all of these patients will still be on treatment. Some of them will have died. Some of them uh, perhaps never started various reasons. Um, others may have started and were lost to follow up. Um, and frankly, others may have started treatment and grew up with us uh, at the MSF clinic and are now no longer adolescents. But we wanted to describe this cohort uh, and again, really dig a little deeper into what was happening, but do it in a scientific and a systematic way. And that's a picture of our, of our clinic in, in the southern Myanmar. 
Uh, we had a few limitations as all uh, studies and all, all data sets have. We are dependent on that fuchsia data, so it's really medicalized data. So uh, things like treatment adherence, a lot of information about effects of the adolescent's uh, psychosocial uh, information or inf uh, information about their environments, which is really important to understanding their experience. Uh, we don't have and we're actually trying to improve upon that in the future since our counselors do have a lot of that information. We also know that a 10-year program is a really long perhaps the adolescents we were seeing in the project changed because of things like politics or even economics or uh, frankly even evolving HIV care records and it could have had subtle effects on our data and then finally a real limitation that we felt was the fact that we can't currently decide between uh, those adolescents who had a perinatal infection or acquired their disease from their mother uh, and those who acquired their disease sexually or through a transfusion and we think that these groups might be quite different and so again in trying to uh, better information and analyze uh, for that. So our results. Uh, the interesting part, when we started this cohort, uh, what did we find out? Um, well, first I can say interesting because we, the adolescents seemed like a pretty good group of patients, at least when you compared them to adults. Uh, we found that they were less sick at presentation to the clinic, at least if you looked at uh, their CD4 counts, which is a measure, obviously, of immune health. Uh, they remained on treatment for longer than adults, uh, and they responded uh, better immunologically over time. But we weren't necessarily really surprised by this. We could at least explain why this might be. Uh, a higher CD4 count at presentation might be because uh, we knew their average age uh, at diagnosis was about seven years. And it's possible that much uh, sicker children had already died at that point, leaving the sample of people we were looking at somewhat biased. Or frankly, perhaps just because they have caregivers, they were accessing treatment sooner. Uh, adolescents stayed on ART longer than adults on average, but again, they have caregivers, and that's really important uh, in this situation. They were less lost to follow up than adults, but um, many or most of these adolescents don't necessarily have jobs like adults do. And in a region that is really affected by economic migration, uh, especially to uh, the fishing communities, uh, that matters. Uh, they did better over time uh, compared to adults uh, immunologically, but uh, they also have younger immune systems, so perhaps could bounce back a little easier. Uh, it was interesting to describe the cohort this way and use the adult cohort as a comparison group, uh, but we weren't necessarily sh shocked by what we were finding. When things got really interesting then was when we dug a little bit deeper and started to look at potential treatment failure. And this is where we saw that the adolescent cohort, uh, about a quarter of them were on second line treatments, meaning that they could not take uh, the, the drugs of first choice that are uh, sometimes easier to take and certainly cheaper uh, because uh, various reasons. We know that adolescents sometimes have reasons besides treatment failure to take second line treatment regimens, uh, perhaps in treatment when they were really young and developed toxicities or side effects over time. But then when we looked at another indicator of treatment failure, which was viral load testing, we saw that adolescents were over three and a half times as likely as adults to have a detectable viral Tested, meaning they had uh, enough virus in their blood that the test uh, could see it and, uh, and therefore uh, we know that the, the treatment is not suppressing their virus, confirming that they're failing their treatment. So again, it was a consistent pattern of treatment failure and this is kind of contradictory. They seem like great patients when you look at them as a cohort, but then uh, when we look at, at uh, a really important indicator, which is how they respond to treatment, uh, they were failing. So uh, what does this mean for, for MSF in Myanmar? Uh, we feel like we have a lot of questions still to answer. Uh, we suspect that there is uh, at uh, large-scale adherence problems for our adolescents, that they're, uh, despite being good patients and coming to the clinic, that they're not taking their medicines. And we don't know if this is because support networks. We know many are orphaned, though we don't know the exact proportion. Uh, we don't know if this is because there's some sort of shame or stigma surrounding take their medicines. Frankly, uh, as teenagers, we don't know if this is a manifestation of depression and uh, some sort of self-harm uh, by not taking their treatment. Uh, and Or we don't know if you know, none of these are true, and if we're wrong and these adolescents are very adherent, uh, really we, we need to look deeper and see what's happening. Uh, 
So what we're going to do uh, is take this cross-sectional analysis we did, and we've, uh, di we've written a, a research, and in the next year, we hope, because we're currently under ethical review, uh, we want to uh, prospective study that ha will have both a clinical and quantitative component uh, and a qualitative component that will look at uh, psychosocial factors and uh, the adolescence environment to really better understand the HIV experience for adolescents in Myanmar. Uh, there's been a lot of research in the last decade on HIV in adolescents, and even in Southeast Asia there has been, but Myanmar uh, is really uh, evolving right now, and, and adolescents haven't really been a part of that conversation. So we think that uh, MSF could uh, really use our voice to, to add to that conversation. And that's a picture of one of our peer support groups uh, that the MSF clinic runs. And uh, so just to sum up, and I probably over time, uh, but if you take away three messages um, from this presentation today, uh, I'd like them to be this. First of all, adolescents are, as a colleague of mine at the MSF clinics, beautifully complex, uh, meaning that they're a really unique group. They're not a pediatric cohort and they're not adults, and we need to respond to them in unique ways because they have special needs. And then to use a term, uh, what gets measured gets done. So a good first step is looking at their data uniquely, not just aggregating them in with other cohorts, but really taking that data, stratifying by age, and seeing what's happening. And if you haven't done that, I guess we at the MSF Myanmar Mission really encourage you to, because you might be surprised as we were. And then finally, simple solutions can be powerful. Uh, we've really redoubled our efforts with this group of adolescents in, the, in southern Myanmar uh, as a result of this cross-sectional analysis, doing more peer support and really letting the adults what they need and have some agency uh, to, to use that sort of newfound autonomy and independence to, to tell us what they need. And I, we don't have data yet, but we've uh, had some really uh, feedback from that. So a final thank you to the Myanmar team who I, I kind of don't know if they can listen to this presentation because of very slow internet, but uh, they, are, they inform every word of this and they're a fantastic team. So uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Janet. I would say that uh, that was an excellent presentation and it has uh, really stimulated the thinking. Uh, you know, there's a paradoxical situation uh, which is pointed out. A group of children which uh, one would see because their disease is less, their compliance is better, immunological response is better, but still their failure rates are high. It's, it's really very, very paradoxical and uh, we need to really work more on this. And I would say that you also spared us a minute or two for, for taking some clarifications. Thank you for that also. So we'll just have one uh, clarification from anyone in the audience, and then we move to the next speaker. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, does Myanmar has a sentinel surveillance mechanism in place to uh, know the estimates of prevalence? If, if at all, what is the prevalence now, latest prevalence? Is it aggregated or not? That is second. Sure. Um, if I if I understand your question correctly, there is a national AIDS program, and they're really uh, doing a lot, especially since recent political openings. Uh, and and there is there's good monitoring and evaluation and surveillance of HIV in the country. Um, but what we have found in our project is that there's certain subpopulations uh, that we feel could uh, get more attention, and that's why I think some of our uh, analyses, the adolescence analyses, and uh, certainly the high risk groups that we've displayed some information about on a poster uh, could use uh, a bit more of a spotlight, I can say. And so that's what, why we're talking about them today. What's the prevalence? Uh, in Myanmar, the prevalence it's, uh, in the general population is 0.5%. But in high-risk groups, it can be up to 17% in drug users. I yeah, I, I believe it's 68 in sex workers. I, I actually, I encourage you to out in the hall. <laughs> Uh, because in the high risk groups, high. yeah, in high risk groups, it's quite high. Yeah. Mhm. Mm mhm. But only 0.5 percent in the general population. I don't have a prevalence of estimate for just adolescents, um, but I think that's kind of what we're trying to encourage: is that the 
and uh, who's very active in HIV management in Myanmar and the National AIDS Program and, and all of the actors, including MSF, who, who you know, engage with these patients that we, that we start to look at them a little more closely. Right. Thank you, Janet. I, I think we'll move on to the next and uh, request uh, if there are any other discussion points for Janet, we'll just park it till the end of the session and we'll again have an opportunity to discuss with you, ma'am. We'll, we'll take your support. And uh, uh, now I'd like to invite our third speaker and uh, Sri Priya Pandurangan. Uh, she's uh, working with the International Union Against uh, Lung Diseases in the Southeast Asia Regional Office here in Delhi. And uh, she's uh, uh, done her bachelor's in statistics and master's in econometrics. She has more than a decade of experience in planning, monitoring, and evaluation. And uh, she has been uh, part of the uh, project which the union is running, uh, dealing again with a marginalized group of population working towards universal access, and that's called the Akshaya project. And I'll uh, request her to give her presentation on novel interventions to enhance access to TV services for the vulnerable and marginalized populations. Thank you, Dr. Sarin, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank us for giving me this opportunity to present one of the largest um, uh, advocacy um, uh, communication social mobilization project which has been implemented by the union to enhance the access to TB services for vulnerable and marginalized populations. So why there is a need for this project? So universal access to TB services is critical for timely diagnosis and treatment. However, low awareness about TB and poor health services results in de delayed diagnosis with resultant morbidity and mortality. So this presentation will focus on interventions uh, which has led to enhance the access to TB services. In line with the NTB strategy, the goal of the project is to improve access to quality TB care and control services through enhanced civil society initiative. Uh, our main objective is to reach the unreached uh, build the capacity of the community, engage care and control services. So the, uh, I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the project has actually many activities. Uh, so I'll just brief you about the activities and then I'll move on to uh, my presentation on the innovative uh, uh, activities. Uh, so the project first, the, uh, the project has identified, mapped and uh, the vulnerable and marginalized population. So this is to achieve the goal of providing universal access to TB care. And the project has also involved with the community, built the capacity of the community, and then we have capacity, uh, built the existing village health communities uh, to discuss about and include TB in the village health agenda. And thereby in the process, we have also involved the health care providers, the rural health care providers, the non-qualified health care providers uh, in, to talk about the TB uh, you know, symptoms in the community, identify them, link them to TB services. Um, so adopting the strategy advocacy, communication, and social mobilization, the project has uh, made advocacy efforts at all levels, uh, sensitized the different stakeholders uh, and ensured this commi their commitment to TB control services. Uh, so all this has led to increased TB uh, case notification and uh, decrease in the uh, last two follow-up cases uh, and improved treatment <coughs> success rates. Uh, thereby achieving the goal of universal access to TB, quality TB care services. So there you can see the coverage of the project. So the project being is implemented in 300 districts uh, across 21 states of India. This has been um, implemented by nine uh, sub-recipient partners. So the, uh, as I have told, this is the union uh, implementing the project with the nine sub recipient partners uh, involving 20,000 community volunteers and 1,200 non-governmental organizations. Uh, so it has reached nearly 16 million population in 300 districts. Uh, so now I'll move on to key uh, innovative strategies which the project has adapted. So the first one is about the Akshaya Samvada. This is an intensive outreach activity 
whereby we have trained the community volunteers to conduct visits, uh, creating awareness about TB and identify those with the symptoms uh, and the symptoms suggestive of TB. So these persons, once we have identified them, uh, we have given the choice of referrals uh, to the nearby diagnostics facilities uh, and if they are unable to go to the diagnostic services, uh, we have actually uh, given them the uh, option of sputum collection and transportation. So where we collect them and then we have transported to the diagnostic services uh, and then we have actually gone back to the patients who are um, positive and then uh, ensured them to put on treatment. So nearly we have, uh, we are reaching 1000 households every month in each district. So the results of uh, this intervention, uh, 5.1 5 5 million households were reached during this period, April 2013 to December 2014, and uh, out of which we have identified nearly 4 lakh TB symptomatics, uh, of them 60 examined, and 7% were uh, diagnosed as TB patients, uh, and uh, we were able to put 97% uh, on um, treatment. The next um, innovative intervention I am going to talk about is uh, the uh, rural health care providers. Um, the unqualified rural health care providers who are the first point of care for the majority of rural and urban poor are trained to identify with symptoms of TB and refer them immediately for sputum examination um, to the nearest public health facility. They have also been trained to provide a directly observed treatment short course for which they get incentives from the RNTCP program. So the results of this uh, training, we have nearly trained 19,000 RSCPs and uh, out of them 13% are engaged with the project. So we mean by engagement, they refer at least three patients in a quarter and then do a sp uh, uh, sputum collection and transportation of at least one uh, patient in a month and provide dots for at least one patient. So this is called engagement in the project. In terms of engagement, the RSCPs were able to identify nearly 50,000 uh, TB symptomatics. 20 percent were, uh, were examined at the DMCs and 12 percent were diagnosed as positive and 98 percent of them were put on treatment. So this um, uh, advocacy social mobilization project uh, has uh, given an, uh, you know, yielding of additional TB. So we have uh, involved the community, we have tapped the local resources uh, to uh, enhance the access to TB services. We, thereby we have also rural healthcare providers uh, to provide the TB services to the community. So uh, uh, though we are implementing in uh, 300 districts, uh, so th in the next uh, NFM uh, uh, Global Fund project, this is going to be you know, replicated in uh, um, uh, again in uh, India in other districts as well. Uh, so thank you for this or, uh, opportunity. So it's really beautiful. I mean, fortunate that my presenters are all time, and in fact, they are giving us some time for. Uh, seeking clarifications and discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, a very interesting uh, talk and uh, universal access. Yes, all of us with the issue as a concept. We must reach and treat every TB patient till the patient gets cured. That's the part of the NTB strategy. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, kindly introduce yourself before uh, asking the question. My name is N.B. Nair. I edit a science journal called Indian Science Journal. Just want to know what is the burden of tuberculosis in India in comparison to the world uh, tuberculosis burden. Second is what is the linkage of air pollution in India? You know, mostly in Delhi and other uh, city pollution is higher than what is normally should be. Linkage between air pollution and uh, TB. Uh, Sri Priya, would you like to take that or would you want me to respond? Okay. Uh, uh, well, uh, I would encourage, uh, you know, at, at this particular session, uh, clarifications from uh, our pre presenter. But just to answer your question, yes, the the burden of the disease in India is high, uh, roughly about uh, uh, 2.7 million TB patients, uh, to be precise, which are prevalent, and about 2 million are added every year. So that's the extent of the burden and uh, globally, uh, you know, we have about say 25% of the incident cases. That's the comparison 
uh, in the world. In relation to air pollution, uh, uh, yes, air pollution uh, does have uh, to some extent on that it has uh, increased uh, chances of an individual getting the disease. As you know, even though most of us present in this hall today would be infected, but there are only a 10% lifetime risk until and unless we get immunocompromised. And uh, airway pollution enhances this particular uh, risk of getting, you know, it, that is to do mainly with the immunological factors which operate uh, at the macrophage level in the lungs because whenever there is air pollution the ability of the lung macrophages to uh, fight against infections reduces that's the reason why you see uh, uh, we uh, who land up with the uh, air pollution also land up with other problems other infections other diseases not just limited to tb but definitely it will also increase tuberculosis Yes, sir. Please introduce uh, yourself. Thank you, uh, Sri Priya. Very nice presentation. I just wanted to know because this is uh, from the point of view of sustainability. What was the action of a, a patient uh, when you made the strategy of active case detection and uh, training of the of the uh, you know these uh, providers? Uh, what was the extra cost? What was the cost per detection? So, um, cost per se, uh, actually, it's, um, uh, there are, the project is being implemented by NGOs. Uh, so, the NGOs were paid for each household, we are paying a uh, 10 rupee uh, to you know, go and uh, reach about the messages to tuberculosis. Uh, and for the rural health care providers, we are giving a training at the district level. Uh, this costs around, uh, for the recipes, we uh, pay them uh, 6,000 uh, per training so yes i think that's a very important come back to that sir again because sustainability of such interventions should always be kept in mind you see we can't have this operating at a project level for decades and decades because you know it's a one time intervention is maybe simpler but if we have to bring about an impact we'll definitely have to have it more often yes sir and that's the last clarification from you and we move on to our last speaker thank you very much my name is suman rajal i'm from dndi uh, uh, I just want to ask, uh, you had 62% of those who were tested. Uh, what happened to the others who was, were suspected but who did not get tested? I mean, does it, there is a system that you, that, that to capture there, those patients or to look into them? Yeah, actually the project where, you know, we are doing a follow-up of actually who, are, and we go and do a follow-up and do collections, put them collection. And some of the, you know, we have seen many studies also in our project also, we see some of them, they are not willing to go to the government facilities. So they either land up in private health facilities or, you know, to any other quacks who, you know, they feel that they are comfortable in, you know, revealing their diseases. Right. So, uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sri Priya, and uh, we move on to our uh, final batsman for the day. We have uh, George Vargis here, uh, who is from the Christian Medical Corps, and uh, uh, his interest in infectious diseases is well known. He's uh, studied it uh, not only in country, he's also uh, been to London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, wherein he's done his uh, postdoctoral fellowship in infectious diseases and uh, Varghese has been doing a lot of work uh, in many infectious diseases but today he will be presenting mainly on uh, typhus, uh, scrub typhus in India, emerging insights and future challenges and opportunities. So uh, Varghese let's have what you have to say. Thank you Dr. Saran for those kind words. Uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Typhus uh, claimed millions during the First and Second World War. The story in India is no different. Uh, it is very clearly documented. Uh, it, uh, the typhus and the other rickettsial infections were major threats to the uh, British Army uh, during those times. However, for several decades, it became a rarity. It was unknown uh, disease. Uh, this was not even kept in the differential diagnosis of uh, someone who comes with acute febrile illnesses for several days. We started uh, noticing 
a group of patients, this is in the late 1990s, group of patients who come with acute febrile illnesses with multiple organ involvement, most of them with hepatitis, uh, some of them with frank jaundice, uh, with pneumonitis, uh, which may even progress to ARDS, aseptic meningitis, and where you look for common causes like falciparum, uh, falciparum malaria, uh, leptospirosis, etc., were all negative. Um, looking harder for these, uh, ha harder for an answer in these patients, we found that there were small S cars considering the possibility of rickettsial infections. Uh, we, this is the time when we uh, looked at it po prospectively. We looked at uh, the uh, 2001, 2002 um, period. We looked at some things uh, coming with these multiple organ involvement with uh, illness, with them uh, having uh, LFT abnormality. Uh, we clearly documented that uh, uh, this is due to scrub typhus. Four major serotypes uh, where their serology was positive for IgM scrub, where all the other workup was negative. This was published in Annals of uh, New York Academy of Sciences in 2003. Uh, in the smaller group of cohort, the case fatality was around uh, 11%. As you know, this is a mite-borne zoonotic bacterial disease caused by Orientia sutsugamushi. The bacteria was earlier called as Rickettsia sutsugamushi, uh, which is transmitted by the chiggers, which is the larval thrombicloid mite, uh, Leptothrombidium most commonly. And this is usually maintained in uh, nature because of the reservoirs, uh, the chiggers and the rats. Uh, there is trans-ovarial transmission and therefore uh, it's indefinitely uh, kept in nature. Uh, and the uh, humans are incidentally infected. So we started working on, um, you know, whenever, at that time, nowhere in the country specific diagnostic test to, to diagnose this particular infection. So we looked at what are the ways, uh, when would you suspect uh, scrub typhus? Uh, the pathognomonic SCAR was found only in 10 or 15 percent of patients uh, at that time. Uh, primarily because awareness was very low unless you search carefully uh, in the axilla, in the groin, um, it, unless you search carefully you wouldn't find the SCAR. Even if you search carefully in 50 percent of them uh, you may not uh, uh, you know uh, find the SCAR. Uh, it may have been very or fallen off. Uh, have also recognized that uh, transaminase ele elevation with thrombocytopenia and leukocytosis could be uh, indicators of multi-organ involvement uh, uh, in acute febrile illnesses with the appropriate epidemiology, uh, which reasonable predictive value in these group of patients, but as you know, specific uh, indicators. Uh, now the issue is, uh, even today, 10 or 15 years down the line, it's grossly under-recognized. The burden and the pattern of uh, scrub typhus have not been documented in India. Uh, therefore, this particular um, study was to describe the public health spread and severity of disease, which can serve as the basis for formulating policy in our country. So what we did is um, uh, to assess the, the disease burden we reviewed the medical literature, literature and also the Government of India's integrated disease surveillance programs and uh, rickettsial infection database uh, at CMC Velour. We also did a cross-sectional population-based survey in Velour district uh, to estimate the community seroprevalence using uh, IgM and IgG uh, serologies. Now, there was also a case control study done to assess the risk factors for acquiring the disease in the community. And the severity of disease and current management options um, were assessed among patients admitted to CMC. Now, when you really look at uh, during this five-year period, there were about 6,649 cases of scrub typhus uh, documented from 24 different states. This is uh, the last five years or so. And five states 
uh, the burden has been quite high. Um, with uh, Tamil Nadu, of course, Bello has been instrumental in, in part of recognizing this uh, re-emergence. Uh, and uh, all these five states, more than 300 cases were documented uh, during this period. Now, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the entire burden which is being reported, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'll give, give you a comparison. Uh, when we looked at our database during this period, it really confirms cryptophys of, of over 3,000 patients, and what has been published in medical literature is only about 450 cases or so. So even that, you must remember that CMC is a tertiary care center, and therefore more severe, severe cases are only admitted into the hospital. So what you're really seeing is just, just a very tip of the iceberg. Now, when we did the community prevalence study, uh, this was a, uh, we have um, done a, a, a good uh, clustered sample design, um, taking about uh, 721 participants from Velour District, um, about 60%, 61% uh, from uh, rural and 30 from uh, the region. Uh, majority were uh, female, 62 and 37.4% were male and the mean age was 50.6 years. As you uh, recognize, the mean age was higher because all these surveys were done during the daytime and most of the, uh, the younger adults would have been out uh, for work and there was a bit of uh, bias in that. However, it still conveys the, the message very clearly. Uh, about 30% uh, have had evidence of um, uh, infection in the past. Uh, IgG is a good marker of the uh, past infection in these, uh, uh, for this infection. When we looked at the case control study to see the, the risk acquiring the disease, um, we uh, took 128 confirmed cases and almost similar number, 132 uh, age and sex matched controls from the same village uh, we tried to look at various factors, uh, be a risk factor for acquiring the disease. Uh, we, being agricultural laborers, uh, there's an increased risk, bushes or shrubs around home. So basically, either as part of occupation or as part of daily life, uh, if they are um, around um, uh, the, the bushes or the scrub, uh, they are at higher risk of developing the disease. Uh, and of course, uh, clothing again makes a difference. You can see the odds ratio. These are some of the ones which clearly uh, stood out saying this is where they are getting exposed and probably uh, getting the disease from. And if you look at the seasonality, uh, the, the cooler months of the year from uh, September to January is when the maximum number of cases are, are, are uh, uh, occurring. Uh, so this is when the, the mites uh, breed uh, and the lava comes out and the disease is transmitted. This is over the years we have seen the same pattern of seasonality as well. Uh, when we looked at the severity and complications, about one third of them uh, will develop um, or, or developed uh, multi-organ dysfunction, uh, almost the same number with um, uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome, many of them uh, going on to uh, require ventilatory support, but it's a dying disease to treat. If you recognize early and treat them, they come out beautifully, unlike most of the other ARDS. So a very gratifying disease to treat. Uh, the case fatality in the SICA group uh, still continued to be about 9%. Doxycycline is the uh, choice, but IV doxycycline was not available in our country until now, uh, which was a major problem. Uh, and the alternative was azithromycin IV. So what we used to do was give IV azithromycin along with oral doxycycline. Somebody who is on ventilator, the absorption, there is a problem. Uh, uh, there the option was IV azithro with acycline, uh, which probably may not have been the best, we don't know, but it was quite a reasonable uh, therapy. So to conclude, scriptyphus is a significant public health threat in India, yet it is under-recognized and grossly under-diagnosed. Doxycycline is the drug of choice. Azithromycin is a good alternative. 
Unavailability of IV doxycycline to treat severe infection necessitates uh, urgent advocacy. That is where uh, uh, MSF comes in. Uh, when we discussed uh, several months ago, uh, we have been advocating this for quite some time. Uh, MSF was more than happy to, to help out, and that is when the whole initiative started. But I'm sure you will be happy to, to note that now the IV doxycycline, we have just got the first talk uh, in the country. Maybe the MSF's willingness itself made a difference uh, to help out. This is one of the uh, major reasons why we thought MSF, uh, we should work with MSF uh, in advocacy uh, to get this uh, IV doxycycline available in the country. Uh, it's a very cheap drug, less is a day for the oral uh, doxycycline for the entire course. But uh, so most of the pharmaceutical industry, because uh, the margin was very low, was not uh, willing, but uh, we are happy that uh, it's available. Information and advocacy are still needed uh, for investing in surveillance, prevention and detection, as well as appropriate management strategies. Thank you very much for uh, your patient listening and also this opportunity to MSF. Thank you, George. Uh, as I would say that he's also followed the trend. We, we have uh, time with us and now also time for the discussions on any of the patients also. In fact, uh, he's talked of a disease which again is, uh, as he's rightly said, underdiagnosed but a disease which has a definitive treatment, a disease where we should have a high index of suspicion, and a disease if left untreated could be very fatal. I would uh, this opportunity to thank all the four speakers on this panel. They have done an excellent job, both to their topic as well as to the time. And they have given us opportunity to interact, discuss, and learn more about these neglected diseases, about these neglected populations. Thank you so much. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to personally thank the MSF India for giving me this chance to be with all of you and to chair this most important session. Thank you so much.